persecution seemed to be that Mr. King had become a member of the recently organized Church of Seventh-day Adventists there in Tennessee. That was what was behind this. And local prejudice took the form of enforcing an obsolete Sunday law in order to retard the growth of the denomination in that part of the state. The result, as usual, was precisely the opposite. Leading newspapers, North and South, took up the matter and gave the case the widest possible publicity, and the editorial articles were mostly in favor of Mr. King. And the Atlanta Constitution of June 20th, 1890 wrote, and the New York World as an editorial in 1893, they wrote, and the Chicago Tribune wrote about it in 1890 as well at some length, and said that the whole country would watch the progress of the case with great interest as it involved a question which had not been before engaged the attention of the National <coughs> Supreme Court. There were a number of similar cases. In May of 1892, the grand jury of Henry County, Tennessee, indicted five farmers these men, whose neighbors testified that it did not disturb them in the least, were nevertheless found guilty, and some of them, as well as others, were, were put in a chain gang, along with hardened criminals, and made to work with them on public roads. One of the most powerful agents in arousing public attention during those early, early years of the association was a, a magazine they came out with called The American Sentinel. We're going to get a little more detail about that later. And it was issued weekly and wholly devoted to the proclamation of the principles of religious liberty. So Adventists were meeting this challenge with everything they had. Now, for 30 years or more, this is what uh, Brother Butler was saying. Now it's over 150 years. And I don't know how far you want me to go here. But, uh, all right, let me know when it's time to. And plane. All right, I have a crash land. But I got a lot of material here, okay? So I, I don't want to overload you. So here's what Brother Butler was saying. For 30 years or more, our people have expected that Sunday laws would be enforced in an oppressive manner against those who observe the seventh day Sabbath. We see now evidence of a rapid approach of the final struggle. Ellen White, when she's, she's alive and, and healthy at this time. And she's saying Jesus wants to come. So here's this legislation to shut down the country with oppressive Sunday laws. At the same time, the latter rain is starting to be falling, uh, poured out. At the same identical time. Isn't that amazing? So while it's getting dark with darkness, it's getting light turned with more light. There's more light while there's more darkness going on at the same time. And God in His wisdom is showing the differences between the two so that the world can see for themselves what is darkness and what is light. Amen. The increasing interest, Brother Butler was saying, in Sunday laws and Sunday sacredness worldwide in extent gives plain proof of the truthfulness of our position. Religious liberty is as important now as it was then. It's always been important. It was important when God created the universe. He gave his creatures freedom of conscience. Isn't that amazing? Beings that can rebel against him. That's amazing to me. I can't, I can't wrap my mind around that. This same year, the Religious Liberty Paper, the American Sentinel, started up and published. It was published in Oakland at the Signs of the Times office. That's where Brother White started. And who was there? J.H. Wagner, that's E.J.'s dad, that's the guy in the middle. He was there as the chief editor, but within a year, both A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner became the chief co-editors of this paper. I'm narrating some of those magazines right now. In 1887, the General Conference appointed a Religious Liberty Committee with A.T. Jones elected as the president. The purpose of this was to give more public exposure to the issue of religious liberty through press releases, public speaking engagements, and circulation of petitions against Sunday proposals. 
the committee also encouraged church members to become actively involved in the cause of religious liberty and provide legal aid for those Adventists indicted for Sunday labor. Adventists have stuff to do for God right now. There's people out here walking around like they're in a trance, they're in a daze. They don't know what to believe. We have light, folks. We're an end time movement. We only exist because God said we would exist. In Revelation 14, verse 12. Actually, verses 1 through 12. We're an end time people. We come into existence because God brought us into, into life. Amen. He brought us into this building. He gave us this message. Amen. He wants us to share it. Amen. First, we got to hear it. Otherwise, we won't know what to share. And then we got to have enough courage to share it with somebody. Amen. Even if it means having our heads cut off. Some of us might get our heads cut off. I don't know. Might be me. Or anybody. I don't know. And so by 1888, the situation had only become much more serious. This NRA, the National Religious Association, seeking the good, seeing the good results of, the, of their work on a state level, once again turned toward the national level and sought to have an amendment to the Constitution of the United States Whereas before, they had been working almost alone on this agenda. But by 1888, several other organizations joined them in their cause. And so by 1887, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was for Sunday legislation. This is the women's thing. This is before women had a right to vote, but they were out there marching. And they put their influence for our national Sunday law. Isn't that amazing? The lady that was in charge of this, McHenry, Sister McHenry, uh, she became, she got very sick, was almost dying. She ends up at, a, at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and she meets A.T. Jones, and she gets converted, and she gives her life to Christ and becomes an Adventist and becomes a very close friend of all whites. And she was in charge of the Women's Temperance Union. It's amazing how that happened. Also that same year, the American Sabbath Union formed and joined the NRA. So there was, you know, there were forces being uh, brought together. And so in early 1888, the, another one called the Prohibition Party also joined the movement, speaking out against the idea of separation of church and state. We have looked just at a little of the history of the religious legislation that led up to the year of 1888. We see that in both the world and in the church, there was an accumulate, a culmination of events that pointed to the fact that Christ was ready at that time to prepare a people to finish up the work and stand during the final scenes of Earth's history. That's what was going on. But because, this, you know who's writing this? Oh, what? But because of disagreements among the brethren against what Jones and Wagner were presenting, the great issues just before the church was lost sight. So here we see this projector going full blast. The whole country's flooded with material. Meetings are being held, press releases, organizations, fighting Sunday laws. And God's beginning to pour out the righteousness of Christ. You can read the endorsements of God online. I've got them in my Bible. But you can see her writing. The, right, the time of test is right upon us. The righteousness of Christ is now being revealed. At the very time this is all going on. And there's a fuss. There's a fuss over the righteousness of Christ. Why is that? Because it lays the glory of man in the dust. See, that's, that's what the blessing of, that's a blessing. Do we need our glory laid in the dust? We yes. sure do. We got so much pride, it's, it's ridiculous. And we need it to be laid in the dust, crushed. See, some of us, some of us don't want that though. And that's where the fuss begins. That's why they hated Christ so much. But he walked on here. He laid the glory of men in the dust. He wasn't mean about it. He didn't have to even say anything. People would just come into his presence and felt rebuked. Amen. Pride and self-sufficiency stood rebuked in the presence of Christ. Amen. 
just a kind face, a benevolent spirit. And they were already upset. They wanted to take him out. See? So this same righteousness is upon us right here, right now. Because of disagreements among the brethren against Jones and Wagner, the great issues before the church were lost sight. Because the ideas of some are not in accordance with their own on every point of doctrine involving minor ideas and theories, which are not vital questions. The great question of the nation's religious liberty now involving so much is to many a matter of little consequence. See, what happened in the 1840s, what they needed to do was what Ellen White was telling them to do. In the late 1840s, they had these Sabbath conferences in barns. And all different communities of Christians got together. There was the Church of Christ, the Presbyterians, Episcopalians. They were the ones that started the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And they had all different ideas about the Bible, about burning in hell forever, the immortality of the soul. They had to get that sorted out. They prayed about it. It's amazing. I went through those experiences and recorded some of them in the studies that I've given. And so it's it's something else. And the Lord would bring them into unity. Well, when they were fussing over Jones and Wagner, the leadership of the church was, and they wrote to Ellen White in Switzerland, she says, you guys, you older brethren, know what to do. What did we do in the 1840s? We got together. Get together with Jones and Wagner and pray. Answer the prayer of Christ in John 17. See? And see what they have to say. She's telling that to all four of them, to Jones and Wagner and to Butler and Smith. She would write the letter on one piece of paper with carbon copies underneath, and then she would mail it to all of them. She was telling all of them, get together with each other. Jones and Wagner were young whippersnappers, young fledglings in the mid-30s. Butler and Smith were the old guys with scars all over their foreheads from being pioneers back in the 1850s and so on. They were the elders. So there was nothing wrong with them getting together. And so they treated this whole thing, this whole thing about religious liberty, just waned. Except for Jones and Black. But as far as the leadership of the church, and Ellen White says this, Satan has been having things his own way. But the Lord has raised up men and giving them a solemn message to bear to his people. To wake up the mighty men. Mm -hmm. To prepare for the battle. For the day of God's preparation. Amen. This message Satan sought to make of no effect. And when every voice and every pen should have been intensely at work. To stay the workings and powers of Satan. They were drawing apart. There was differences of opinion. God's moving forward. He's got people moving forward. All of a sudden, there's people going, whoa, 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 I wear my mouth too much in board meetings, maybe even just in life. And I'm afraid to say the wrong thing all the time. And i got to make sure the Lord's leading me. Sometimes when I don't, I, I, it never fails. And if you're not under the control 100% by the Lord, you're under the control of somebody else. Amen. And you're going to say something, and it's going to hurt. Satan sought to make of none effect, and when every voice and every pen should have been intensely at work. They were drawing apart because of differences of opinion. Ellen White says, a great crisis awaits the people of God. Very soon, our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as the sacred day. For years, many have sat in calm expectation of this event, and they will not be working out the purposes of God if they comfort themselves with the thought that what is to come will come. They told Jones, settle down, brother. Let the Sunday laws go, man. Let them, then we can all go home. Let them have their Sunday laws. And we can just go home and say, 
Oh, really? Is that what you think? If our people continue in the listless attitude in which they have been, God cannot pour out His, His Spirit upon them. Amen. That's the latter rain we're talking Amen. about. See, the latter rain is involved in this religious liberty stuff. Don't fool yourself. Don't think this is just some topic on the side over here. Oh, no. Religious liberty is at the very core of the latter rain message. It's at the great controversy. Amen. It's why Jesus died on the cross Amen. to preserve our religious liberty. If we're going to sit back and just sit this one out, you're in trouble, big time. And you will not have the Holy Spirit poured upon you. The peculiar work of the third angel has not been seen in its importance. God meant that this people should be far in advance of what they are today. But now, when the time has come, for them to spring into action, they have to get ready. They should be getting ready all this time. For 30 years, Sister White has been saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We read it this morning in Isaiah chapter 40. Babylon is coming. Jeremiah said it. Babylon is coming. Some were listening, like Daniel's parents. And they trained up a child in the way he should go. Yeah. And when he, when these young men got grown up, they were taken captive. They knew exactly what to do. Yeah. They didn't just scramble. Now what are we supposed Amen. to do? Amen. Freak out. You better know what to do before the time comes when you have to do it. Yes, sir. No one didn't start building your art and it started drizzling out. Amen. Amen. That's right. 120 years when the sun was shining and everybody was partying up and laughing at him. Him and his team were working on that ark. Yes. We need to be working on the ark right now. Amen. We got more freedom here. I'm talking to a guy that's editing my narrations in Santa Alita, California. He's right across the street from where Loft Girls buried. He can see Ellen White's home from his house. You know, he's an Adventist guy. And he says he can't go to church. He can take his lawn chair and put it in the parking lot. And sit on it and look at the building. But he can't go inside like we are right here right now. And he's aching to do work for God. He's tickled pink. I sent him a narrated book and the next day he's got it edited. The guy's starving to death over there. He loves this. He wants more work. You know, I'm going to have to, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But praise the Lord. You got see so now is the time to not get ready. We should be ready already. We are far behind. The national reform movement has been regarded by some of so little importance that they have not thought it necessary to give much attention to it. So as Adventists, we're watching for the Pope. Is the Pope going to have a play? Oh, yes. Is the beast and all that. It's all, yes, all going to happen. But do we see the image to the beast being performed right now? Do we have discernment? Where's the image of the beast? We're watching the Protestants. I talked with Dale. You know Dale. And uh, we're looking at the evangelical Christians. They're not saying, they're not doing anything. What are they doing about Sunday night? Nothing. They're, they're actually fighting against this whole thing about liberty of conscience. They're, they're saying we should have conscience. They're, they're standing. Bless their hearts. But we see this mentality amongst us right now of shutting down churches, shutting down your freedoms. You can't uh, do things according to your conscience. You have to get a vaccination, even if it's against your, your conscience. You're still going to have to do it. You won't be able to get gas. If you don't have that proof on your card that you've got been vaccinated, you won't be able to buy gas or food. That's what, what uh, the chatter right here. What do you think, of, uh, what do you think uh, uh, repression is? Oppression is? Persecution is? What do you think what it means when your conscience is restricted? How do you think it's going to look like when, when the evangelicals come up with the Sunday law? Well, that'll happen. But there's already stuff already in the making right now. There's an image being formed right in our face. Do we see it? And she goes on to say, and if ever felt that in so doing, then we'd be given time to questions distinct from the third angel's message. May the Lord forgive our brethren, Ellen White is saying, for interpreting the very message for this time. 
The third angel's message comprehends more than many suppose. The third angel's message is the genius of God in an end time setting. Amen. How smart is God? Does anybody know? Can you comprehend it? Well, the cross of Calvary is the genius of God in an end time setting. It's called the three angels' messages. This cross, the principle of the cross of Calvary, the plan of salvation, is how God built the deity, an entire incomprehensible universe. And it's all, all that wisdom is at, is at, is at our demand. Our, you know, God wants to give it to us. If we're willing to humble ourselves and stand for Him, when the heavens fall. What interpretation do they give to the passage which says, an angel descends from heaven and the earth was light with his glory? The people need to be aroused in regard to the dangers of the present time. The watchmen are asleep. We are years behind. We're not supposed to be here. In the days of Jones and Wagner, they could freely travel. They could get on their horses and carriages and trains and boats and go places. We're being challenged right now about traveling. Perils are now, now threaten the people of God. And what will they do? We have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, what are our people going to do in this matter? What are we going to do? Now, we can't speak for the whole church. That's not our job. That's none of our business. But we can do something right here, right now, in this community and where we live. You think there's people down the street, down this way, over here, in the community, that want to know what we know? There's one lady sitting here right now that came here. There's other people, perhaps. And we've seen them come in and out over the time since I've been coming here. There's, hard, there's honest hearted people out here. We don't know them. God knows who they are. He wants them to be blessed. Amen. He wants them to come here and sit down and listen to this and fellowship with us. What's wrong with that? See, so we can do something about it in our own little space here. Not wait for the church to do it. Wait for them to do it over there, for the leadership in Washington, D.C. to do it. How about we do it right here? Or are we going to do this? But these guys are doing it. You know, well, I think I'm at, I think I've got a lot more to share. I can, I can share if you want to hang out after lunch. I got more stuff for those who are interested. And uh, it's good stuff. Amen. If there was ever a time we needed the Lord, it's right here, Amen. right now. Amen. God is so good, is He not? Amen. He said, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Those folks clung to those scriptures when they were carted off. God wants to come from us right now. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that good news? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for being so patient with us. This is a form of captivity, Lord. We're learning how to make bricks without straw. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for being patient. Your, your discipline is to get us woke, the real waking woken up by your Holy Spirit, by this message, Lord. We do want to go home. We do want to live in that world that you've been telling us about, Lord, but we want to bring as many people as we can with us. And so thank you, Father, for these opportunities. Thank you for this honor. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this time that we've had right here, right now. May we not squander, Lord. We might get a reprieve. We might get a, a small window where maybe things will get back to normal. I don't know, or maybe not. But if we do, help us not to squander it. Help us to get ready, to get busy, to do what you call us to do. Help us to depend upon you. Help us not to resist having our glory laid in the dust, because it's good for us. Because when you lay our glory in the dust, Lord, what do you give us instead? Your glory. Right. And your glory is way better than our glory. Our glory, as the Bible says, is filthy rags. And that's a kind way of saying it in the original Hebrew from what I have. And so, thank you, Father, for being so patient, so loving, so kind. 
And may we honor you in everything we say or do. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Ourselves to you fully is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.